Wouldn't it be nice to have several thought leaders in your industry know and love your brand? Start a podcast. Invite your industry's thought leaders to be guests on your show. And start reaping the benefits of having a network full of industry influencers. Learn more at sweetfishmedia.com. You're listening to B2B Growth, a daily podcast for B2B leaders. We've interviewed names you've probably heard before, like Gary Vaynerchuk and Simon Sinek, but you've probably never heard from the majority of our guests. That's because the bulk of our interviews aren't with professional speakers and authors. Most of our guests are in the trenches leading sales and marketing teams. They're implementing strategy. They're experimenting with tactics. They're building the fastest growing B2B companies in the world. My name is James Carberry. I'm the founder of Sweetfish Media, a podcast agency for B2B brands, and I'm also one of the co-hosts of this show. When we're not interviewing sales and marketing leaders, you'll hear stories from behind the scenes of our own business. We'll share the ups and downs of our journey as we attempt to take over the world. Just kidding. Well, maybe. Let's get into the show. Welcome back to the B2B Growth Show. I'm your host for today's episode, Logan Lyles, Director of Partnerships here at Sweetfish Media. I'm joined today by Keith Brannon. He is the CMO at Casasa. Keith, how are you doing today? Doing great. How are you? I am doing fantastic. Thank you so much Good. for joining us today. Um, we're going to be talking about how to find the right balance for your organization between uh, standard demand gen and new account-based marketing strategies. Um, some folks would say, you know, new or not new, but uh, regardless, yeah, I think I all it. marketers are trying to figure this out is how do they find the right balance that most importantly is right for their organization. Before we do that, I would love for you to give listeners a little bit of context. Keith, tell us a little bit about your background and what you and the team at Casasa are up to these days. Uh, sure. I'm, uh, as you say, the chief marketing officer at Casasa. We have uh, two teams here, actually, that are very different. One is full B2B and lead gen and demand gen, and another is B2C. So I actually operate on both sides. And the, the reason for that is that our organization is a fintech company that basically builds uh, and distributes technology and marketing for community banks and credit unions. So we'll go through a typical exercise with an institution and find out exactly how to financially engineer their checking accounts so they can be high reward checking accounts. A Casasa cash account pays in the neighborhood right now nationally of about 3%, which is about 40 times more than a mega bank. Uh, account does for a free checking account. Um, we, same with our cash back products, extremely high interest, and we've just engineered them in a way where it's good for the consumer, it's good for the institution, um, it's good for us, and so everybody wins, and we build those products, but every institution has to name it Casasa. And the reason for that is now, right, as of today, uh, we have in the neighborhood of 600 Casasa banks and credit unions in the United States who distribute our product. And it allows me as a marketer and my teams to go in and identify the commonalities across market because we're using one brand instead of, you know, someone calling it free checking and another ultimate free and another one blue dog checking or whatever they decide to name it. <laughs> and you just, you just can't learn anything that way. And this allows us to help smaller institutions compete with really large institutions that are very data enabled because the, the lack of data in their account base is what really limits some of the smaller institutions. So it's a, it's a great product for the consumer. And we're, we've been doing this for about 14 years. We're actually the originator of reward checking in the United States. So wow. very, very cool history. Um, and so my role includes not just building the consumer facing for those institutions, but also acquiring those institutions and figuring out mm -hmm. uh, you know, what they need and what right. their strategy is that we can support. Right. Like you said, you've, you've got a mixture of B2B and B2C marketing happening under yep. one roof and, and right. uh, within one team that you're directing. I think that that gives you a very unique perspective. And, and you alluded to something there in, in looking at, you know, larger swaths of data to inform, you know, the client facing marketing. And I, I, we're going to touch on that a little bit. Um, I know you have some, some great insights to share yep. with listeners when it comes to data and CRM in this balance of demand gen and ABM. But as we were talking offline a little bit, Keith, you mentioned something that I thought was really poignant that I think would be a great 
uh, jumping off point here. And that is, if you're looking at where do I go with ABM, does it need to be 10% of my efforts? Does it need to be 90% of my efforts or somewhere in the middle is looking at your specific situation? What are some of the things that that you've found in your organization um, helped make that direction for you guys to, to inform that decision? There's a number of uh, factors in that for sure. Our, our demand gen and B2B shop overall is um, very effective at generating leads for our sales team. Um, and one interesting note about our client base, though, we have in, in our total market opportunity in the neighborhood of 6,600 target uh, institutions total. And that number is unlikely to ever increase. So as banks consolidate, we don't add a lot more banks and credit unions in the United States. So it's slowly deteriorating. Mm -hmm. Now the banks get larger, so there's still the same amount of business there. It's just consolidated. And so for us, that that's very impactful because when you just do a, um, a normal approach at demand gen, which is make sure you get plenty of touches on the market and lots of media into the market and target it at the buyer, and then call them and follow up and have them talk to by salespeople. 6,600 is not that many, right? Mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. that's not a right. lot of institutions to receive the amount of communication that we're talking about. You know, if they're receiving nurture emails and content that you generate and um, interacting with you at social and all these other places, um, your event strategy, and then at the same time, you know, you're calling them every quarter or you're calling four or five people at their institution, which is what we do because we have approximately five buyers involved in our sale of the product. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we have to develop all five of them. And so for us, the demand gen has been extremely effective. And so the number one, number one criteria, of course, for us in, in shifting our strategy at all was don't kill the golden goose. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, I love the ABM strategy and the, and the approach for it. But demand gen is the golden goose because that's what keeps the pipeline full. And so we... Mm -hmm. For us, it's it's making sure we're very thoughtful about how to do it. Um, the first thing that we started doing um, was we we believed we were getting more um, touches on the market than the market could absorb. And so the first thing we actually did was dial back some of the less personal messaging um, on our demand gen side, like uh, um, anonymous emails or nurture based emails, until we really got our opt outs down super low, almost to zero. And, and so that allowed us to say, okay, we're, we're not oversaturating the market, and yet we're still getting the leads that we need out of the market. So all thumbs up, right? Those are all positive things. Mm -hmm. And then the, the second thing that, that we did was really started looking at what would an ABM strategy mean for our institution and for Casasa. We're different than a lot of uh, ABM strategy organizations because most ABM is based on sort of account-based, large account long, long, long sales cycles. Mm -hmm. Ours, none of our institutions are super huge, right, compared to the mega banks. And so for us, it's more about making sure that we're talking to them about something that's important to them. And we try very hard to build relationships with them. I have a lead gen team here that does outbound calling to generate the leads. They're territory-based. And so they, they do call directly into the institution, but we're trying very hard to make sure that we're leveraging data about that institution through LinkedIn, FDIC, their balance sheets, and figuring out what might be working for that institution and what might not be working. So that when mm -hmm. we call them, we're at least in the ballpark, right, mm -hmm. of, <laughs> of, of what we might want to talk to them about. And, yeah. and that's been extremely helpful. Yeah. So you have the SDRs or BDRs within your organization doing more research in reducing the amount of touches and, and activity that they're sending out to make those more personalized? We do, which is actually a very hysterical thing that happened to us at my last executive offsite. We have a, a CFO who I love dearly, and she came by at the offsite and we were doing our executive planning retreat and she was like, Hey, I just have to question, are we staffed correctly? Because I mean, I see a lot of people on the internet and not making calls. And I was like, yes, I know they're all doing research. So the calls are quality calls. That's, the, that's part of the gig now. And, but it's really interesting that you say that because that is one of the number one tactics to say, hey, let's dial it back a little bit and be very sure, you know, and so that mm -hmm. that definitely requires more research time on their part. But we've we have been able to, by managing the volume, 
and by working very closely with our sales leaders and our sales team members to say, what are the scenarios that you're bumping into in your market that you see your institutions having? Mm -hmm. um, and when I say scenarios, I'll give you a couple of them for us. So instead of being, you know, pure all the way on ABM content, we are trying to pick more macro level scenarios now so that we don't get too complicated and too, try to be too precise. And so mm -hmm. uh, here's a good example. If you were trying to talk to institutions, banking institutions in California, the California market has a lot of really great credit unions. Um, that are retail focused, meaning they deal with consumers. They also have a lot of banks that are community banks, but probably more than anything else in California, we have a ton of community banks that are mainly commercial banks. They don't really support quite as many consumers as a credit union would. So in the same market, these institutions look very different on their balance mm -hmm. sheets. Right. And and so what's been happening for us that we've noticed and that has the feedback we've gotten from our sales team is, hey, I've got a lot of banks across the country, especially some of the big markets, where they have a commercial bank that is trying to move into the retail space because they need more deposits and they want to secure more accounts for long-term strategic planning, which is a smart thing to do right now. And that's a very difficult shift to make for an institution. And they're usually concerned about it, right? It's a, it, it, it really pops on their demand list of, oh my gosh, I don't, I don't know exactly how to do this. How do I find the right partner? Mm -hmm. And so when we see institutions now in our data that say, oh, this is definitely a commercial bank. One of the first things we talk to them about is, looks like you might need deposits. And as a commercial institution, many are talking about going retail. Here's how we've helped other people. And it, and it just, it's a very, it's a much more interesting conversation to the person on the other side of the phone instead of having to feel around and find out what they're interested in. It's story time. And this growth story is about search engine marketing. Okay, so the story revolves around eSub, a project management SaaS company specifically for subcontractors. Even though eSub had incredible customer attention, they struggled with growth. Being a niche service, they discovered that there was little demand expressed for their solutions within search engines. To take on this challenge, eSub hired Directive Consulting, the B2B search marketing agency. After refining targeting, pre-qualifying clicks with an ad copy, and developing custom landing pages, Directive was able to increase eSub's marketing qualified leads by 71% while decreasing their cost per lead by 65%. I have a hunch that Directive can get these kind of results for you too. So head over to directiveconsulting.com and request a totally free custom proposal. That's directiveconsulting.com. All right, let's get back to this interview. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it doesn't matter if you're selling uh, into the financial sector, in, to sales leaders, what whatever functional role or industry you're selling into, buyers have less time for us to qualify and, and poke and prod until we find yes. the pain. We need to go where the pain is or where the potential opportunity is and, and show them how we can lead them to that new opportunity. How do you work with your sales team, uh, Keith, to to then kind of leverage that? Because I imagine that there's identifying that trend and then how yep. do we apply that to conversations? But then how do you split that up into, you know, where is sales using those conversations? Where's mm -hmm. sales development um, and where's marketing and, and kind of yep. splitting that, that one topic or that one trend that you've identified into those three different areas? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And, and so we're actually still kind of in the process of making that work. And here, here's, here's what I mean. Like we have on our sales team, a full on sales team, of course, in the market for every territory, but we also have an internal team for lead gen that reports to me. And then secondarily on the sales team, we have uh, what you would normally call a sales consultant that helps sort of construct pro formas and, and make sure that the product's designed correctly to show to the prospective client. Mm -hmm. Those individual um, sales consultants have been unbelievably helpful for our marketers and our lead gen team because they're here in the home office a lot and we have access to them as compared to the guys in the field and say they don't have quite the recency bias if I just talked to this customer and this is the problem. Um, and, and so these team members here internally that are the sales consultants have been one of our primary feedbacks about, hey, you've seen 20 contracts this week or 20 opportunities this week. Tell us a little bit about what the scenarios you're experiencing are so we could really get a good handle on what's going on and narrow them down. And then once we do that, there are, there are multiple ways that we start to cut the content. And the first one is just on the street level, talking to them as, I mean, the easiest one, 
talk to a credit union like a credit union and a bank like a bank, right? Super simple. Mm -hmm. And the reason to do that is credit unions are very member focused. Banks are very profit focused. And those are two very different like approaches to why you want to buy a product. And so just cutting it that way to start with is a really important one. And then understanding below that, the data that tells us, here's a customer who needs more loans or more deposits. And most people don't know this, but that would be how a bank said it. And a credit union would say they need more loans or shares or share drafts. They have a share account or a share draft. That's what they call checking accounts. Mm -hmm. So just sort of starting to connect with them about their needs and their language and our marketing um, is marketing's job. And then our whole job on the B2B side is after we book the appointment, salesperson has the appointment with an MQL. And our whole job is to try and get them to the, the next big appointment, which is a larger executive group meeting. And so mm -hmm. we build content to target the five buyers that can be distributed as video content for them to consume and then um, helps, you know, make sure that next meeting gets set. It, it kind of helps our sponsor be willing to share that content because it's high quality with mm -hmm. their peers mm -hmm. so that it's less risky for them to say, oh, here's where I want you to come to this big group meeting. Right. Yep. And so we're trying to, sense. we're trying to help our sponsors a lot. And that's, I think that's the marketing's job. And then the sales team, I mean, they're in there having those face-to-face -face meetings, following up on the, um, the content that goes out. And so, and that piece in the middle there where we're building more compelling content is that's the part we're working on now to try and influence those results mm -hmm. inside the that. funnel. So you touched on it a little bit there talking about uh, data and we alluded to it earlier, Keith, you mentioned uh, as we were chatting offline that leaning into how you leverage your data and the CRM yeah. is very important, especially if you've got a smaller addressable market and you're going to lean, you know, 50% or more to an account based strategy. Yep. You learned some lessons about cleaning up the data uh, here recently that I know you wanted to share with listeners. Yeah, for sure. You know, there's uh, in, there's two things about CRM that I think are really important for us as marketers to to understand. The first one is that uh, CRM is truly about a sales process first, um, and so it's not necessarily just about the client information. It's about the process that they're going through. And so the first step for us was really clearly working with our sales team members for them to define the sales process that was working and for us to constantly sort of work around that and then figure out how can marketing get into those stages to help better top of the funnel and mid funnel. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a working within that it's a very big deal for us. And that keeps us aligned with the sales team so that they know if they're not using CRM, the reports are wrong and lots of people are going to be upset. And <laughs> and candidly right now, because of the energy that we have behind it, I mean, I don't think I've ever been with an organization that has the level of CRM adoption that we have. I mean, mm -hmm. like our guys use that thing top to bottom every day. I can pull up reports anytime and feel that they're like, if they're not right, it's because they haven't been updated in two days, not because they're not using it, you know, for their mm -hmm. job. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a great pain point to eliminate is an alignment between myself as the marketing leader and the head of sales that this is going to be the record of truth for everybody. What um, were some of the, some of the things that you you discussed as as sales and marketing leadership together to get headed down that path or some of the points where the sales team kind of got it like oh this is why I really need to to lean into keeping my portion of the CRM clean and up to date and these are the benefits I'm going to get back from it as marketing uses this data as well. Yeah, for sure the the benefits to everyone are nobody makes anywhere near the number of mistakes that could be made by not having up-to-date data about a client or a prospective client that you might be in funnel talking to. And, you know, one of the things that we did, honestly, was since the lead gen team uses it exclusively and they are all here in the home office and we can get our hands on them, that group, that's all they can use. And so mm -hmm. all leads are presented only through the CRM tool and mm -hmm. they come with, you know, defined tasks that happen after that. And so all of my reports, stop the second it gets handed off, right? And then they start looking at aging reports and how rapidly did it get followed up on that kind of stuff. And that has to mirror what my sales counterparts reports look like. And there was a period of time where we'd say, hey, you're not following up on your leads. And he'd call his team and say, hey, what's the deal? Why aren't you following up on these leads? And they say, well, I am. I've got my notes right here. And he'd say, that doesn't count. <laughs> it, it doesn't count if I have to call you to get it. I should right. be able to pull right. it up, right? 
And so it, it probably took him as a leader about six months to really pull the whole group in. And then every training session he does, it's all about how to how to do whatever he's wanting done in the tool. And it's been that's been awesome. And then our responsibility on the marketing side is not just to sort of work within that same process and support them, but to make sure the data is good. Um, mm-hmm. And that was like for us this year and uh, probably mid last year. We started making new investments into data from new sources to expand, you know, the number of buyers that we had access to at each of these institutions. Mm-hmm. Um, and we hired a couple of external sources that would not only give us data, but then a data cleaner, basically. They would go through our entire stack of CRM data, mm-hmm. about 90,000 people at these institutions total that we had access to, and um, start cleaning them. And I was truly floored how rapidly our data was aging and if you're in a market and you're not keeping that crm data up to speed every year and it's not just part of your budget that you're going to spend that money to get that stuff done i can tell you the numbers are astounding our data was aging at around 20 percent per year meaning bad data 20 percent a year which means mm-hmm. automatically whatever's in your crm you're going to miss your lead goal by 20 percent if you're dependent <laughs> upon your crm to get it yeah, yeah that's incredible yeah. uh-huh and then I went back and checked with my team, and right now, almost 30% of our leads for this year have been generated by data that was brand new. Wow. Incredible. And I mean, I hate to say this, but this is the first year that I've had on my standing budget every year go through and clean that stuff every single year mm-hmm. because yeah. the turnover of employees in every market, yep. people changing jobs, mm-hmm. people expanding, companies adding jobs, yep. roles just change. Yeah. And if I had to go back to the beginning of the year and suddenly not have that information, I was going to miss my number by 30%. I would probably not be on this call. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell yeah. you that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's pretty telling about uh, yeah. the benefits of going through that sort of exercise. And and I like the way you point it to, you know, the, the larger trend there, you know, people are changing jobs more frequently. Business is happening faster. Businesses are, yeah. are growing and failing faster. And so it just makes sense that the contact information, the, and other yep. bits of information that we're buying and, and using for it to manage in on the target of the market that we want to address uh, is it, changing just as rapidly. So I, and we I rarely, think, it's ahead. confidence. It's confidence too. Like mm-hmm. we, I, I'm sure yeah. everyone who ever listens to this podcast on the B2B side would say they've had their sales team members call and say, oh, all the data in there is bad. I, I called that one. That person doesn't work there anymore. This person doesn't yep. work there anymore. Yep. And it immediately erodes confidence in using the tool that you most need them to be reliant on. And so just making sure that when they log into an opportunity here, and we use Salesforce, so when when we convert a contact into an opportunity, and that opportunity brings along four other contacts at that company with it, and they pick up the phone and call one of those people, and it's right like 90% of the time, that is a huge deal for us. Yeah, yeah. Because it gives them confidence to keep doing it. Yeah. I mean, I, I've been, you know, on sales teams where, you know, we, we bought data and, uh, you know, it didn't take long for me to lose confidence yeah. in that data in just a couple of those calls, right? Yep. It, it sours you very quickly. So I think that's great advice for marketers as they're trying to get sales to buy into this idea of the CRM as the single record of truth, because it brings benefit to them. What we can do on the marketing side to help our sales counterparts believe in that data is, is to invest in, in clean cleaning it up um, and you point to good reason why we should be doing yep. that more frequently. And, the, and, and for us, even on the marketing side, on the ABM from, from an ABM approach, like we're, we're definitely not concerned about any more about personalizing the mm-hmm. messages yeah. we send out or the content right. that we send out. Whereas before um, I would not have done that. Right. Cause right, it, and right. It, and it's tough to have a good ABM strategy without being personal. That's just the nature of the beast. And so exactly. You, you, you want to keep that, those fundamentals clean because you're mm-hmm. going to have marketers and lead gen experts who turn over and you want them to inherit clean information. Mm-hmm. Otherwise you got to start from scratch every time. Yep, absolutely. And that's exactly where I was going to wrap it up to Keith is, you know, a- an ABM strategy is so centered around very personalized content that if you're, if you're not feeling confident there, that's a good bit of spend to dump into yeah. something that's going to miss the mark 20 or yeah. 30% of the time. Right. 
That's right. Um, well, Keith, this has been a great conversation. I think there are a lot of marketers who are going to get some value out of what you shared today and some of the things that you guys have been doing to determine uh, your balance between your demand gen approach and your ABM approach. If anybody yep. listening to this would like to reach out or stay connected with you, what's the best way for them to go about doing that? Sure. Yeah, they can uh, reach out to me uh, on my LinkedIn is probably the best way. Um, it's uh, Keith Brannan. B-R-A-N-N-A-N, and I am the Chief Marketing Officer of Casasa. You're welcome to connect with me and just put a note in there so they know that you heard about me on the podcast, and that'd be great. And um, It's been, it's been uh, wonderful having the opportunity to speak with you today, Logan. Awesome. Well, Keith, thanks again for being on the show and for sharing your expertise with our listeners. Yeah, thank you again. And thanks so much for uh, hosting a B2B podcast and forwarding um, the what I believe is one of the more overlooked sciences in uh, the marketing front. So this, this is really good stuff. Thank you. Awesome. Really appreciate it, Keith. Yep. Digital marketing agencies have a tough job. You have to stay on top of the latest marketing strategies for your clients and your agency. What if there was a way you could address both at the same time? Imagine your agency putting out content with greater quality and quantity. Envision bringing your clients a turnkey solution for one of B2B marketing's fastest growing media strategies, podcasting. You know all those clients asking for your help with their account-based marketing efforts? Picture being the first to bring them the idea of content-based networking showing them the proven strategy for breaking into their most coveted accounts. Here's the concept. Sweetfish Media is looking to work with a limited number of innovative agencies interested in a new partnership model. We produce a podcast for your agency. You introduce the power of podcasting and Sweetfish services to your clients. Everybody wins. Learn more at sweetfishpartners.com.